questions from, from you guys, so prepare your questions. Be pithy if you can. So I would like to ask you one more question, um, and then you guys can join in the fun. I'm sure there's a, there's a, there's a wealth of insightful questions and comments from there. Oh, the last question I'd like to ask, I have so many other questions, but I want this question. I mean, I want an honest answer because everything doesn't always go right. We're talking about why design matters and, you know, you guys are knowledgeable. You've done great things in your careers and your lives. You've contributed a lot to society, but tell us some of the challenges when something has gone wrong and what, what has informed you, how it's informed you and your work and your life and your approach. And I'm not trying to destroy your business, so you don't have to tell us the gory details, but I need to know some of those examples because we we know that we live in an imperfect system here. You know, nothing is well designed already, so we inherited that already, and traffic every day, all that. So give us something concrete that has not quite worked the way you would have liked it to, or that you have been part of or you have seen, and then um, and how, how what it tells you and how it's, it's, it's changed your approach, maybe. Okay, I, um, I'll, I'll start if you don't mind, and maybe I'll come back later on after some of those comments are made. Um, lesson, and, and it's, this is one project, all right? Um, and coming back to what you said earlier, you know, you gave a description. You said, um, you saw that architecture will sit on the landscape if you made a mistake, and you don't want to be part of that mistake. When you are dead and gone, people will be insulting you. All right? I never met Ken Scott. I'm sorry, I keep mentioning Ken's name. Um, but I'm going to mention names like Joado, who, whose home, if anybody has been to that house, it's, it's an amazing, an amazing way of thinking. Um, um, if you look at the IFC today, that's the International Finance Corporation building, you know, it's funny, you drive around with other designers from around the, the world, and in two seconds they see it. And there's a lot of garbage going on around us. All right. Um, you look at the Netherlands Embassy building. Yes. It's sad. I mean, um, the, um, this is my opinion. The presidential road is on the same road, but it doesn't trust me. In the in the eyes of designers, hmm, it doesn't sort of attract the energy we are looking for. All right. I'm I'm going to say it. I I'm sorry. That's my opinion as a designer because I've spoken to gardeners about it. A gardener student says. What is this? And and it always sort of bothers you why we should sit in our landscape and not do the right things. All right. So back to what we were discussing. I I personally think that in that example that I'm about to talk about, I have to be a stickler for discipline. So a design has been best. And you have hired, why do people hire architects again, Joe? Why, why do they do that? You hire the architect and you get there and you want to do your own thing. Why are you, why are you wasting your time and his time? <laughs> How much is he charging you anyway? Even if it's a percentage, 10, 15, 20% of the value of the building that's coming out, it's peanuts. So you've done this great design and that client says, oh, I will, I will take my contractor. I'm happy to do that. But can we see his works? What is his discipline? So we go and the client insists, and hey, you're a young architect, you've gotten a client to even accept a very avant-garde and not acceptable design in a landscape. You're happy to go with it. So you compromise a bit. You pick this guy whose work you've not really seen. And then as they start building, errors happen. But you see, at that point, the, the client is a contractor. He's buying stuff and he's already vouched for this guy. So when the walls are crooked, you're like, my designs, as you've seen, play a lot with simplicity. And let me go back to a bit of that. We can't get it right. Doing even a circle in construction, even in Europe, is a hard thing. So I think it's really, can you just do a straight wall for me? Let me see what that is. And that's what that design was. It was, it was an, you know, an exploration of space. And, and I, I sort of like, like to merge the outsides with the insides. I, I am claustrophobic. I hate um, really you know, tight spaces. So yeah, I, I like to get the light in because as I said, it's an asset. This guy virtually messed up the building. Every day we had to watch it. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful design. And many people have been there and said, we love the idea, but the execution is terrible. I don't want my name on that. So I think that's one of the big challenges. 
um, and, and I would plead with clients to trust their architects. There is no point. It's a relationship. That's what I said. If, you see, if, if they come to you, first of all, they've seen something. You may not have wanted to use that fabric, and as you said, a bit of advocacy, but they'll bring the material. I, I won't change it if you tell me you want to use earth bricks for your building. I'll be excited to use that. But on the philosophy of the design, I doubt they, they will have a discussion with you on how to go. Oh, put a pink rose here, and nobody will. They won't do it. I, I don't think you will do that. But if you come with a budget, and I think that's where great creativity is. You know, I think that's where great creativity is. You need to, you need to go to your architect and say, Mr. Architect, I have only fifty thousand dollars, and I want a four-bedroom house. Then he begins to tell you, Hmm, unless we build with some matchsticks and paper, it's not possible. So maybe let's explore using, uh, let's explore using natural materials that will not be painted. So we're just gonna construct it one time and we're going to leave. So there's a lot of creativity that you can come up with. But at that point, you have accepted the philosophy of the architect. It doesn't change the material. So I, I think that's that's one of the challenges, getting clients to come over. But it's a, it's a daily battle and we're excited to be part of that battle to change the minds um, and create a, a fantastic Ghana. I, I, I love my Ghana, so that's why I'm here. Okay. Design, it, it, it's not, even though I, I've talked about the discipline and all that, it is not always deliberate. The best designs were accidents, really, as a designer. I'm going to show in Paris, I used to do Paris, Milan and all that, you've done your collection, you have a deadline. You need to make 20 outfits. Four days to the, your departure day, you realize that you got four outfits short so within that four days you have to create four outfits so you take this fabric you take this idea you compromise and you create your four outfits then you go to the fashion show or the exhibition and the buyers come for those four outfits that you created as an afterthought then you ask yourself why? What do they see in it that I don't see in it? I created those stuff, but they were an afterthought. And maybe that spontaneity and that simplicity, not consciously trying to impress yourself and the rest of the world, that's what makes it so the cock ups. <laughs> Sometimes the cock ups are not from the designer. Let me put it there, I'm perfect. I know me. Yes. <laughs> but then your machinist or technician will really screw something up and you've got a day for delivery. So that's why you put it on the dummy and then you scratch her because he or she has bent a massive hole out of the fabric. <laughs> so then you take another fabric and then you create this pattern and then he put it there, and then the client comes and says, that wasn't the original design. I said, I had a peak of inspiration. <laughs> so I was looking at them, and I realized that this place did this. <laughs> the whole point is getting away with it. <laughs> so I come back to it, but you see, um, I started my life, when I left college, I went straight before college broke up, this was in London. I just I went straight to Schubert, a uh, wholesale um, couture company. Okay, I was doing this wholesale couture, and it was difficult because uh, John Lewis, uh, those who have been in John, John Lewis or Debenhams, we say, okay, we want to choose two lines. Then they invite seven companies who bring about seven lines each. You have to maximize your uh, chances of uh, selling one garment, you know, there. But that one order for that one garment is about 250,000 pounds selling. So on my first entry, I think it was the lack of the gods. Uh, I sold a garment. Uh, the second one was dry. Third one, I sold the garment, but I realized that 
I've dived into the deep end and I could not swim. You see, at college, in a term, you come up with about six beautiful design for your project work, and here I was, oh, the money was good. 1977, they were paying me 400 pounds a week. That was hot. <laughs> but that heat was killing me because I was not ready for it. Even my cock ups were selling. Okay, but then I, I, I realized at the end of the day it's about the integrity in what we do. So a client comes to you and uh, they want something. You know, because you don't also always want to foist an idea on the client. Because some people ask you, these are some people are conservative with the capital C. <laughs> that they are on French. They come to you because you can make them a good garment. They don't want your innovation. They don't want things flying. In Ghana here, I design and create what is needed. Not what is possible. I make my money by contract designs. I don't even put my name on the clothes. I just do the design, cut the pattern, send it to the clients. They sell the things. I made my money at the bank. <laughs> There's no emotion attached there. If you want to make money in fashion, don't get emotional with the clothes. <laughs> now. <laughs> If you, want, if you want to meet a fashion dictator, you come to me. <laughs> because um, I don't take myself seriously, but if you mess with my work, I kill you. <laughs> it, it's a simple rule. Now let me explain that. Those who know of me, a lot of people don't know me, uh, that I'm, I, I'm a real horrible, uh, person. Uh, oh, you do? <laughs> she is such a liar. Okay. Uh, I am jealous of my clothes and therefore the integrity in there is absolute. When things go wrong, and they do go wrong, I do my absolute best to remedy that situation. But through that remedy, sometimes you come up with a design, an idea, which wasn't your original intention, but it is pleasing. It shows me the way for the other design. And I get excited um, with design before it is completed. Once it is completed, the work is over, it's gone. But when you're about 25% uh, to completion, that is when you actually learn from design. It is on the dummy, and I'm going around and I'm saying, if I change the sleeve this way, how would it look? If I, the bodice, if I made it shorter or drop it and all that, so you play with it, that's when it's done. I come with a sketchbook and I'm sketching along all the time. Nobody steps into my studio with a magazine. I'll chuck you out of the window. Because if you came to me as a designer, then trust me to design something for you. Um, I am not, uh, should I try to be superior with my client, but uh, I earned a few laurels. And uh, I try to let you know that I can be good for you. So call cards, they will come, but uh, we try and remember. When it's really bad, throw the garment away, give them back their money, apologize profusely. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing advice. A round of applause. <laughs> uh, we're going to get into the question time. I, I'd like this to be fluid. Make sure you introduce yourself and now. Uh, oh, you're the first in line. Okay, and uh, ask your question. And if I get the sense that you've done quite a lot of work in Francophone <laughs> countries. Um, and I was wondering why. But then I'm also wondering how you found the Francophone market and what kind of sense do you get about the difference between maybe some of the styles we have in Anglophone Africa um, as compared to what we have in Francophone Africa. And then I wanted to ask both B and Mr. Ansa 
um, their thoughts on pret a ready to wear fashion, because I get the sense that both of you privilege bespoke fashion. Thank you. Uh, okay, well, how did I get into the whole uh, francophone world um, of fashion? First of all, I speak French, so I think um, due to that, it was kind of easy to uh, surf the net, to network with the uh, French-speaking people and designers. And um, basically what I realized after my initial visits uh, to the francophone world is that they actually perceive and respect uh, and deem fashion designers as artists. And if you know, I mean, if, if you remember what I said initially, I think of myself more of an artist than a dressmaker. I did not go to fashion school, you know. I, I don't, I can't really call myself a proper seamstress, to be honest. I've, I've always been more interested in the artistic aspect of clothing. So uh, what I did was uh, I employed people who could cut and who could stitch. Uh, and, and I know that if I were to give that same piece of cloth, to them without guiding them or giving them ideas they'd never come up with the same idea so basically I'm the artistic director the, the, the concepts are mine I take credit for the clothes even if I didn't stitch them and I like the idea that in francophone Africa uh, people were calling people like Kofi and myself les créateurs you know they were calling us les artistes as opposed to uh, tailor or seamstress. Now when I say this, I do not mean any disrespect because I must say um, I probably would never have survived in my business without tailors and seamstresses. Uh, so, so having said that, I just want to create a very clear distinction uh, you know, between people who are purely artists and who come up with ideas and people who are technical, who realize our concepts and our dreams and, and you know, uh, upon whom we actually uh, depend, people like myself. Uh, yes, indeed, in Francophone Africa, they veer you know, more towards couture uh, fashion when it comes to runway. And uh, uh, in, Fran in Anglophone Africa, it's more about pret-a-pote and, you know, ready to wear ca casual sort of, of uh, fashion. Uh, I have done both, actually. Interestingly enough, uh, the few times that I try to do casual, um, because probably folks are so uh, used to seeing eclectic, weird, I don't know, over the top things from me, uh, the, the few times that I did try to make quote unquote wearable clothes, it didn't, it was too banal. It was like, this is not me. You know, this is like the, the next designer. People were not expecting to see those kind of clothes from me. Basically, you know, where I put myself, you know, that I created that kind of expectation. And for me, it was more fun, honestly. What I did was, um, in my shop, I had very wearable clothing. And I did that purely, uh, it wasn't clothes that I didn't like. Because I, I told you from the word go, my philosophy is that, you know, my clothes are my children. So I even, no matter how simple the dress is, I still have to love it. You know, uh, and so yes, I did clothes. I knew that I was in, in Ghana, so you have to consider the context. It was a business. I did have to sell because I had bills to pay like anybody else. And when it came to fashion shows, that was the opportunity for me to go wild and do all the clothes that I couldn't possibly sell to normal people because I understood that you know, I, I did, you know, folks here are conservative and they wouldn't wear those kind of clothes. So for me, it was a bit of like a split personality kind of thing, you know, where. I, I could very well do a very elegant, simple. I, I, did, I can confess that most of the money that I did in this business was from selling very simple, wearable clothing to, you know, uh, middle age, middle class people. Clothes, you know, I mean, most of my, my, my clients were people who worked for UN agencies, diplomats, you know, uh, African expatriates working for different, I mean, all those kind of, and these are not people who were you know, dresses with frills and pink roses and whatnot and paillettes all over the place, you know. So I had to make clothing that was elegant. Uh, those are probably not the clothes that you see on my site. But then be that's because I wanted fun, crazy stuff to be out there on, on my site. But that it's not, it doesn't mean I'm incapable of making something elegant, you know. I mean, Kofi Ansa, he is dying to have a shirt of mine, but he's just... <laughs> Francophone, Anglophone, Anglophone, Francophone. 
I don't like uh, francophone fashion. <laughs> no, because they, they don't do fashion, they copy. They just take aspects of French, uh, the part of the collection. They started the catalog before I even came to Ghana. You see, I had my formative years in London, and London is a hotbed for creativity, design, and crazy ideas. There's a certain bohemian indiscipline that would freeze you to think. After all, most of the fashion movement started from London. I was lucky to have studied at Chelsea, on the King's Road, the Sissi's Youth Revolution, the, uh, what do you call it, punk rockers, the new romantics, and all that. When you go to the London fashion colleges, the creative hubs that you find was amazing. And I found the same thing when I came to Ghana, uh, in reverse, we were so conservative. <laughs> Nothing was moving here. No, but no, no, seriously, um, mo you see, this is it. Most of the creative designers that you found in France came from Britain. I don't care what anybody says. It's Saint Laurent was an establishment. They started the houses, the business of it. They had the discipline to create the house because um, Italy and France are Catholic nations. And the Catholics in the convent, you are disciplined to doing certain type of work, living a certain type of way to help their industry. And they broke away and did this whole thing. Cheshire La Farm, there was a woman involved in there. So it destroyed the whole fabric of uh, the English. Thing. But then it freed you to be creative. I actually created the Federation of African Designers. When I came back to Ghana, uh, I was invited by ACP to do a show in um, Paris, the Pret a Porte Feminine uh, Port Versailles. So I got people like Mauli, Nara Panaman, um, the prevailing designers of the time, and I took them there. I met Alpha D, uh, I met Chris Edu when he was alive. The funny thing I studied under Guy Laroche one year in Paris, and Chris Edu was at Yves Saint Laurent, we never met. We came back to Africa to go and meet there, so we wrote the paper and all that. Um, but I started the Federation of African Designers. Chris was the oldest among us, so we had the three revolving presidency, Alpha D, Chris Edu, and myself, and we gave the presidency to Chris Edu. After that year, he just went home and died, and then he started revolving. But we, in Ghana here, you see, uh, the Francophones had the wax paint. What has happened here is very exciting. What am I saying? So I'm part of the story to the point that somebody wrote a real biblical letter to me, damning me, when we, I brought in Woodin from Ivory Coast to Ghana, and he said, say, look great. Uh, they say, remember Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> if you think you're a creator, you be turned to ashes, a pillar of salt, and, uh, and I go, wow. Anyway, that's Ghana. Uh, uh, but the, Anglophone fashion is fluid. You know that we don't really have an industry so ready to wear and all that. Most of the fashion you see here are copies of uh, existing ideas. Uh, Nigeria have their own thing. I think Ghana fashion is the best. They don't you think so? Hello, <laughs> kind of photographer. Okay, um, this question goes to the entire panel. Uh, as a creative person, how do you differentiate between a mistake and a stroke of genius? Do you think that people can be conditioned to accept a design as good? A mistake is it's unintentional. A mistake is unintentional. You know, as I say, it's not how many times you fall down. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is how you manage a mistake. How you manage a mistake. Columbus uh, 
discovered uh, America by mistake. <laughs> but then it was a stroke of genius, I raised my case. <laughs> Oh. There's music, there's fashion, there's architecture. I'm more from the architectural side. But you know, I love B, I love what you're doing in fashion. Um, and the thing is that um, with all of these, you know, parallels, I can still see the intersections and I'm looking at what it is that's resonating and it's that good design, you know, good design is specific. Good design is not generic. Okay, so my question here, I think in part you've answered it, but then it has to do more with how can we begin to garner, and especially in architecture, I think there have been headways made in, you know, fashion, but how can we begin to look at design in specificity, you know, giving Ghanaians using local materials, local resources, what it is they want with, you know, a budget in mind. How, how do we begin to do that specifically? Um, let, let me, she didn't introduce herself. Um, that's Mrs. Richardson. So, thank you. Um, I, I think that's what. <laughs> Um, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think an example is already set for us. Um, I, I was very excited when I, Joe, before you came in, because we were wondering whether you would be able to get in from Nigeria. Um, when we were chatting, I was chat, chatting with Tuli, and um, I was very excited because together with Ruth and um, we've always asked ourselves, AID, you know, Aki Africa. We always meet here and talk about fantastic ideas. Um, but, and I believe in the talking capital. But when are we going to get to action? When are we going to do something? And I was pleasantly surprised that, you know, my, my first appearance on, on this platform, you are launching this uh, partnership, you know, to, to, to start doing some of these things and being very practical about some of the ideas that you've spoken about and we all believe in. So I, I applaud that, that, that effort. But I think that's a question that, Ruthan is asking. And I think Francis Carrere has already shown a way. Um, and his story, I think a lot of people know, so I'm not going to belabor the issue. It's using, okay, well, he created a school, went to school in Gando, his village, in Burkina Faso, Faso somewhere in Ouagadougou, a village in Ouagadougou, and had the opportunity to go to Germany. So he, I think during his thesis, he keeps thinking about that classroom he sat in, that horrible space, which he called an oven. I think it was in this, on this same platform that he spoke about it, and came back to try and resolve the issue, and that's designed as a problem solver, all right? So he creates this, this, he, he creates this school um, with a double roof system, which is very iconic, using the same materials. In fact, it, it's, it's what he will call the architecture of earth and community. And I think that we have a lot of that here. Um, a lot of architects haven't sort of looked at the local issue. And we are always sort of focusing on um, big clients and who's going to... The budget is important. I mean, we need to still survive and make sure that things happen. But I think that our minds can be pitted against the real problems, and that's where design matters. There, there are a lot of problems in our communities. And I think that one of the things, and in, in answer to... Uh, Ruthan is to start um, engaging business people, engaging uh, people who have the budget and, and who are brave enough, like, like Lloyd, Lloyd Wright. I mean, some of the great architects we have are, have always had great patrons. We need those great patrons. Great patrons like I want to push a, a, an idea ahead. I, I've had a problem with our, our school buildings, and you were saying they're all bar house, and you know, I, I get that. But I, I'm a strong believer in the fact that space can shape the next generation. Space. Just, just the right kind of environment that you live in can shape that. And we don't need to construct huge Doric or Ionic uh, columns that cost too much. One can sort of use that great creativity, I mean, to create spaces that Years later, you would realize that the children who are growing are beginning to become very responsive. So, Joe, I applaud you, and I think that if Joe has started, we are offering our services in, 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 in that, and I think you've always asked for it. 
to, to ensure that we can begin to solve the problems on our landscape. The, the last one I saw was really very disturbing. There's a project that's going on in Tamale. Um, and the, 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 the buildings are blocks. There are no shading devices. They look like something in Accra. And they said there was uh, government housing for something. I was disturbed. Because the people will die in those buildings. These are four-story buildings. Um, when the typology in the north simply suggests that buildings are kevilunia for a reason. Why didn't we? So it means our great-grandfathers are even smarter than us. It, it's, it's disturbing that people would allow such buildings to get built. And I think that we can no longer sit down and keep quiet about it. We need to go out there and advocate as a solution because it's not just why does design matter, it's how can we make it begin to change our landscape and begin to bring us an identity as people. So that's that.